the next session before I welcome her I wanted to make a, a brief statement in view of what we agreed on last time we were together for presidency Honorable Minister of State in charge of economic monitoring who is uh, heading to these uh, arrangements Dr. Kasiri Watochi uh, Honorable members who are here in our various capacities allow me to thank you very much for sparing your valuable time to come and discuss this very important aspect. The enthusiasm, Honorable Minister, that I have seen since morning and since the other meetings we had is very, very encouraging, especially to me who is sitting in this on the steering wheel of my youth sector. Allow me to thank you very much wholeheartedly. If I had the hands, I would have done it myself to clap for you. But you know, you are eating. Please take it that I'm sincerely very grateful on behalf of my sector. My sector, uh, since yesterday, is having a joint agricultural sector review which we have to do uh, to cut out every year to account for what we planned the previous year and uh, what we have been able to implement and even achieve so we are in to, uh, today, yesterday and today and you are aware that I have new ministers of state. My not being there is, is already felt and you will bear with me. I will take your uh, messages and the sign that I've seen so far from you that you are together with that group which is in Munyonyo. All districts are there. Uh, they are represented by chief administrative officers, chairpersons, other DCs, and uh, production coordinators. So whatever is going on eventually has to be uh, received by the stakeholders who are now in Manyanyo, part, part of them are in Manyanyo. So allow me to, uh, to thank, before I even go to some other things. Let me mention Uganda Agri Business Alliance. Thank you for uh, partnering with us in this process. NEPAD, we sincerely thank you very much for your contribution and everything. German Cooperation Agency, Microfinance uh, uh, Work for Africa, CADIP, and others who are here, all the bankers, please. I, I uh, offer my sincere thanks. So, Madam Chair, last time on my part, my if that is Minister of Agriculture and Industry and Fisheries, I was required by the honorable members here to indicate uh, some items. Let me recognize my brother, General Ruketa is here, uh, uh, Deputy Chairperson of Operation Wealth Creation. General Ruketa, please can we receive him with a clap. Thank you. 
we agreed and, and I want to inform you that uh, the items high in the agenda, not limited to, uh, to what I'm going to say, but uh, uh, high uh, as you asked. Yeah, one coffee, these are value addition uh, items in the value chain for emphasis, coffee, tea, maize, rice, cassava, dairy, beef, the oil crops, and the fisheries. Of course, the others also are very, very important, but you asked to know uh, uh, that, uh, which items we have put high on the agenda of the value chain. Two extension, Madam Chair. Uh, up to today, we have recruited 48% of the extension staff requirement. By the end of this financial year, come June 30th, we shall have recruited, for all the, the sub-counties, we shall have recruited 68%. Uh, that has been agreed by, between MAIF, the Prime Minister's Office, and the Minister of Public Service and Finance. So by the end of this financial year, we shall have reached 68% of the required extension staff on the ground. Uh, then the next financial year we shall reach 82 and the third financial year 100 percent. So that is uh, 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 the report on extension. Uh, Madam Chair, the Honorable Minister, sir, uh, we are carrying out the farm identification Process. We are carrying out one for the fisheries. You know what is and what, what is happening with the fisheries. We are trying to curb the illegal fisher, uh, fisher, <laughs> the illegal fishing. We want to bring order to our water bodies and also have control over these resources and even uh, use these resources to develop uh, the, the fisheries uh, sector uh, the, and uh, the industry itself. And uh, I will inform you later on that this sector, the subsector, the fisheries subsector, is an area which if well controlled and well organized, is an area where you should pick a lot of interest because it brings back uh, dividends, um, uh, uh, profits quite much in a shorter time than, than other areas. So we are trying to do that in the fisheries subsector. Then with the farmers, uh, I want to raise the fears of my brother and even the fears of Honorable Dr. Kisamba Mugirwa. All is not lost. We are doing something. We are done. We know what we want. And we can't just keep on lamenting. We are here. You are here. You have come. We, we are even challenged that the financial base or power in our country is already interested in, in financing our sector. We can't sit back and start uh, lamenting. I want to assure you that uh, organizing farmers is high on the agenda and I think we should provide you with the uh, uh, registers of very organized, well organized, well structured, structured farmers organizations in just a few months. Before the end of this financial year, we should have done this. And we are discussing it 
there now in our review so that we don't keep on telling you about unorganized or disorganized farmers or subsistence farmers. We are going to organize them into viable groups. Some groups are already organized, they are there, and we are going to provide you with those that are already uh, organized so that you know that some work is being done. So farm registration will also be carried out. We are trying to reach an agreement in our own system systems uh, <clears throat> to see how best we can present a farmer's register. But we are already in advanced stages. So, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, allow me to thank you very much for sparing your time to come and attend to this very important uh, aspect. Uh, in, uh, the other things on policy and, and, and uh, the policy on uh, insurance, uh, agricultural insurance, and uh, 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 others, certainly we are going to speed up the process so that many of the things are in place to provide a conducive environment for uh, agriculture financing. Allow me to thank you very much, Honorable Minister of State, uh, Honorable Dr. Kassiv, for heading this uh, program today. I wish you uh, a good day, and I hand over to the chairperson of the next session. Thank you very much. The Honorable Ministers, the participants, from the various sectors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this high level meeting on agriculture financing in Uganda. You all are aware that Uganda is striving to attain a middle income come year 2020. So as we strive, it is everybody's effort to make sure that we attain that status. The government, however, has put in place a number of financing arrangements in various institutions, in banks, in microfinance, microfinance support center, the agriculture credit facility, Bank of Uganda, and others. I just want to thank the organizer of this meeting to give me the opportunity to chair this session. I would like to thank the presenters who have done it and who have given us whatever it will require any of us to attain that status for the work well done. This morning I have uh, two topics and two people will make presentation, presentations on these topics and uh, the topic before us is synopsis of recommendations for improving agriculture financing in Uganda and it is going to be presented by none other than Mr. Edward Katende, the executive, the, e, the CEO Uganda Agribusiness Alliance and Mr. Katende coordinates Uganda Agriculture Finance Platform. He has over 18, experience, 18 years of experience in accounting and finance. We all know the time is not our, on, on, on our side and we shall have uh, the topics to be, to be presented in uh, 
between five to ten minutes. Can I now please call upon Mr. Edward Katendi to make his presentation? Mr. Edward Katendi. Thank you, Madam Minister. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've already been introduced. I want to take you through our presentation, uh, particularly what has transpired over the last, I think, coming to nine months. We started the journey with a high-level conference in December last year in Munyonyo, and in that conference we had uh, a number of recommendations from a number of you who are there. We have managed to implement some of them uh, this year. When I say we, as the Agriculture Finance Platform, we've managed to implement some of them. The first one was to have a home for agriculture finance at government level. We managed to achieve that, that the Ministry of Finance is gazetted as a home for agriculture financing. They have a desk officer. Now we are lobbying for a full secretariat so we can have someone who is 100% dedicating their time on agriculture financing issues in our country. The other thing that we managed to do is to actually get now the Ministry of Finance to agree to develop an agriculture financing policy. As you've heard in the speeches earlier and also in the budget speech in June, uh, the government of Uganda has committed to develop an agriculture financing policy but also an agriculture insurance policy. Those were the quickest. The other one, of course, was to de designate our platform as a champion for agriculture financing. And as a champion, we do support the Ministry of Finance, which is our lead ministry in our financing issues. We support them, we provide with them with technical um, support. And among us, which the first assignment we have had with them is to undertake a, a diagnostic mapping of agriculture financing in the country. A uh, uh, consultant has been engaged with support from NEPAD um, agency, and she has already started work with the demand side. She will come and talk to you, the banking sector. We would urge you to uh, kindly accord her as much assistance as possible so she can gather the information that will help not only government to develop the policy but also you the banking sector to design the products uh, instruments and innovations that will fill the gaps identified in that mapping exercise some of the things i've mentioned are in this recommendation so i will ask the gentleman who is on the powerpoint to lead me through that very quickly one one of the things i wanted to emphasize this morning we've had a lot from the government. I would love this session, Madam Chair, with your permission, this session to be more of you, the private sector, talking to government. Because as a platform, we want to hear your concerns, and we need to want to ensure that government can address those concerns. By you coming there and you go back with that wisdom will not help us, especially in this process of designing the policy and the strategy. Uh, you've been seeing um, a lot about the agriculture financing platform. What is it? Very quickly, it's a multi-stakeholder platform that is focused on seeing effective actions that will increase, one, the depth, two, the quality, and three, the absorption of financial services by all actors in the ag agriculture sector. Next, please. The biggest question we want to, to see is, can we use a market system to provide appropriate financing for all the various activities of the different types and sizes of Ugandan agribusinesses. I need to emphasize the market system here because we want everybody in that value chain to thrive. It has a, a leadership, it's shared by SNV, Netherland Development Organization, ABI Trust, and the Ministry of Finance are co-chairs. We Uganda Agribusiness Alliance are hosting it and lead the secretariat. We have a 15-member uh, steering committee. Uh, next, from the next uh, slide, you will see the members of that steering committee. It's very rich, but we are still welcoming more people to join the steering committee. Others are just joining as members. Next, please. There are two complementary roles. I've already talked about the Ministry of Finance being a home for agriculture financing. Their biggest uh, role is to coordinate what is happening at government level. 
before we, we as you know there is quite a lot of money involved at government level you have some money in agriculture, some money in finance, in Bank of Uganda, in trade, in, 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 uh, in gender. But we need that to be coordinated so that at the end there is an effective impact. And we see that the Ministry of Finance as our home be doing that, but also they are at the heart of developing our policy. As as a champion, our role is to, to champion and aggregate concerns. That's why I want you to talk more to the politicians so that our concerns are noted. But also we, we aggregate expertise uh, in the sector to be able to provide that technical support to government. Next, please. Um, last time, uh, on the 19th of, of, of July, we had a meeting. We had two presentations from AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and the Africa Development Bank. That uh, meeting concentrated more on the risk-sharing uh, arrangements that are, are, are working uh, in other parts of the continent. Um, but also we learned uh, why those resharing facilities were set up by AGRA, particularly helping the Nigerian government, uh, but also the African Development Bank. And very quickly they have said, they, they came up with a couple of key highlights, what, what they, they thought are the successful attributes for financing agriculture. The first thing they said about the models they have used is successful financing, financial models work best when both the financial and the agricultural value chains are strengthened. That was one of the, the key highlights that came out of that meeting. And then uh, we also say the strengthening financial and agricultural value chain, uh, as well as delivery mechanisms between uh, them will improve access to finance, leading to increased food security and farm incomes. Capacity building is crucial. I think uh, someone here mentioned it. Uh, but let's go to the next slide because capacity building is part of that. They presented a model that has worked in Nigeria, which encourages banks to lend more to the private sector, to the farmers particularly. And in that model, it's called the Nigeria Incentive-Based Risk Sharing Scheme. This is based from uh, Agra's experience, for example, when you look at number one, which is a risk sharing fund. Through, um, through guarantees, they realize that you can leverage up to 10 times of the money you put into a risk fund. So the Nigerian uh, government has set up such, that fund with five pillars. One is the risk sharing, the second was on technical assistance. This is where capacity building, both for the banks and the demand side. Someone mentioned the farmers being streamlined, and I think the deputy governor said the source of the risk is the smallholder farmer. And in this particular model, the technical assistance aspect of the fund is actually helping those farmers to build their capacity so they can deal with the risks uh, they face. The insurance pillar, then there's bank incentives. I will not uh, list all of them. We share the report of this meeting. I'm sure some of you have already uh, read this. If you haven't, we can have a chat later on. Next, please. That leads me to the recommendations. We divided our recommendations into three. One was those recommendations that uh, were directed at the Ministry of Finance. The first one which we, we thought needed uh, attention is the support from everybody involved uh, to, to, towards the ongoing national agriculture financing uh, mapping. Uh, because at the end of the day, whatever we introduce, in most cases, it, we have been using a scattergun approach without knowing what the realities on the ground are. So we think that this mapping will help us to identify, one, the gaps to the mismatches, and even on policies, it's not just looking at, uh, at the, 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 the banks, what the banks are doing, but we're also looking at the policies. The second thing that we, we, we emphasize is, can we support government to develop this policy so that by November, December this year, at least we have a draft in place. That should be uh, very good news for, for everybody involved. The third one is speeding up the drafting of the regu regulations. Uh, I think uh, Bank of Uganda is here uh, to guide us where we are. Maybe you will tell us later, Mr. Kariango, where we are on the regulations under the, uh, the Financial Institutions Act 
and the tier 4 because the last time everyone said that this was good news in terms of laws but the regulations are very slow in, in coming in so we need to you will update us where we are uh, the, the next one is consider establishing an incentive basic sharing facility much as uh, we thought it's not uh, our biggest um, solution but there is general consensus that risk sharing facility is similar to the ones in Nairobi, in uh, Nigeria and Kenya has a smaller one called Profit. Uh, we, we, as a country we need to consider establishing one perhaps as we design this strategy. Uh, the next one is, of course, is strengthening government-owned financial institutions to take the lead. There are some areas where our private sector financial institutions are, are shying away from lending to agriculture. But we thought that uh, the financial institutions that we already have in place need to be strengthened and, 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 um, and energized to lend more to the sector. This, of course, included UDB, uh, Pride, and uh, Posti Bank, and probably Microfinance Support Center. Uh, we think that if those institutions are, are strengthened, then government can channel financing through them to create a demonstrative effect, which demonstrative e effect, if it's commercially viable, other financial institutions can pick a leaf, and that should unlock more financing to the sector. We, we, we took a, looked at undertaking an independent review of government and development partner policies. There was word that some of the government policies are contradictory. Some policies uh, sabotage uh, government itself, and uh, there is a need for a thorough review of some of these policies. The reason why we brought Dr. Tsaba Mgaba here is to actually also look at a program that has just come into, into the, uh, that has just been removed. What can we pick from it as we talk about setting an, a risk sharing facility? Is, is there anything that we can learn from the previous schemes that we had uh, in place? And I think there's something we can learn from his wisdom. And the next one is you collectively design an agricultural financing instrument. This was in relation to working with the Uganda Institute of Bankers to, to develop some uh, financing, financing instruments and designation of information on existing products and models for financing agriculture. Very few Ugandans are aware of the money uh, under ACF, for example. Um, many people out there do not know, even the highly educated. Uh, there are a number of other programs that we have, products in banks that people have no clue about. And we think that we as a platform and we should collectively work together to disseminate this kind of information so farmers and other agriculture stakeholders can use it. Uh, next, please. It's a very long list, but uh, I will take you to the last one on that one, is we need to develop a roadmap for financing agriculture in Uganda, and perhaps we should, uh, after this meeting, we should embark on that and agree uh, together uh, on that. Next, please. The next round of recommendations were aimed at the, the Ministry of Agriculture, and before the minister left, I had asked him to actually brief us on those three areas. He has already told us uh, a couple of value chains that his ministry has, has chosen um, as priority value chains. He has also told us that he's currently working uh, on profiling the farmers. You know, you heard what he said about fish. So I'll not repeat what he has said, but he has already answered that, and we will work with his ministry to ensure that these recommendations are, are followed up and implemented. Next, please. The last two, we are not sure which ministry to put them under. Land tenure has been a big issue if you have to in the agriculture is land based and land in our country is a time bomb so we we need to find a way of addressing the land reform issues land rights and other issues uh, other areas to ensure that we can unlock the potential that we have in our land and also to help our farmers uh, use those uh, not just the rights but use the land as collateral because at the moment, I think uh, the, 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 the single most important collateral that our financial institutions are using is land, and it's a big issue. Then the, the last one is, of course, improving the collateral registries. Can I look at the, last, the next slide, please? Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Katende, for such a well such topic in agriculture and financing. Honourable members and participants, you all know that agriculture is a sector which is looked at in addition to some other sectors that the country is looking at, that everybody has to embrace, everybody has to look at, at in order to enhance, in order to drive this country to where we want it to be. And uh, Mr. Katende has talked about Minister of Finance to agree to develop agriculture financing and insurance policies. He also mentioned, uh, I'm only picking, I've picked a few, mentioned uh, is the accessibility of financing more so to the farmers by the financing institutions. But what he didn't mention is at affordable, affordable interest rates, because that is a very, very important factor that uh, most of us ignore. If the interest rate is higher, then accessibility will not be all that favorable, and it will not favor uh, the so-called users of the financing institutions. And then also, he looked at capacity building of farmers. The farmers out there need to be sensitized, and they could be knowing what to do, but they could not be knowing what to do rightly, so they need to be sensitized. As we talk about building capacity, we should really look at sensitizing farmers out there, and that is the only way the farmers will effectively utilize the financing towards the sector of agriculture. Then uh, hope in the government to develop the policies and then speeding up the draft of regulations by the Bank of Uganda. Of course, there's quite a lot that need to be put in place together, but it's only not only one sector has to do it, 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 it is a collective responsibility for everybody, for the institutions, for the government, and for everybody concerned in this area. And uh, you also uh, talked about land. Everybody knows land in Uganda is a time bomb. In every part of Uganda, land is an issue. People are fighting, people are killing one another, people are doing this and the other. So the land issue should be sorted out if at all this sector is to develop well, if at all the agriculture is to be merged together and if effectively with the financing institutions. Um, honorable members and colleagues, I just want, because of time, a, Many has been discussed, but uh, all the points that have been discussed, I think we have the handouts. You love to discuss on that. The time for discussion will be given, but I just have to devote it this time to the next presenter for the next topic. And um, the next topic of our presentation is. Uh, the banker's perspective to risk sharing in Uganda by Mr. Richard Wangwe. Mr. Richard Wangwe is the head agribusiness Stanbic Bank and he has 18 years experience in financing, agriculture and the agriculture development ranging from microfinance to large scale farming, processing, trade and exports. Mr. Wangwe, please come over and take up the microphone for the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
the Honorable Ministers, uh, Heads of Government uh, Departments, Development Partners, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like to take this pleasure uh, to take to you through some proposals as regards uh, the setting up of an incentive-based risk-sharing risk system for agriculture lending. But before I go into this, I just want to acknowledge and also just to give you a bit of background as to where we've come from. Uh, one of them that, were, that was, has been mentioned by uh, the Deputy Governor of Bank of Uganda, especially the challenges faced by smallholder farming farmers in Uganda and the need to focus on them. Secondly, copying of good practices, and this paper has coped some practices, successful practices, both in Ghana and Nigeria. And then, of course, the other issue is looking at uh, the finance value chain, because we are talking more of uh, the culture value chain, but we also need to consider also the financing value chain. And of course, lastly, challenges that have been mentioned first by different financial institutions as regards financing agriculture. Next slide, please. As you're aware, our culture still remains uh, a backbone of our economy. And one interesting thing that we cannot run away from is the fact that, that our culture production comes almost exclusively from the 2.2 million smallholders who are mostly working on two to three hectares of land. Uh, this also takes, of course, of recent we've got, we've got uh, large scale farmers who have come up in northern and northwest Uganda but still the majority of production is under the, the smallholder farmers. And one of the major challenges facing our culture producers and traders is that Uganda is a high production, that we have a high production distribution costs that compress the farm gate. And fortunately enough, if it were not to be the fact that, uh, that most farmers do not factor in their family labor as a cost, most of their production would be a loss. Further to this is that uh, 68% of, of the 7 million rural homesteads are not in the money economy. Next, please. So there's a need to transform our culture production from subsistence to commercial. Not only as us here, but of course it's a government, government, the government of Uganda is encouraging this transformation. And of course the growing of our culture sector in Uganda means development of the economy because the majority of our people are in rural areas improvement of food supply and food security, and of course increased household incomes and improved life, life of the majority of people, including the women and youth. Next, please. Next, please. Sorry. will continue as, uh, as they work out the technology. Now this presentation looks at the means of enhancing our culture finance with the focus mainly on banking, the perceived unbankable. That's the 68% of the 7 million rural house, ho ho homesteads who are not in the money economy. And then it also looks at affordability and appropriate financing for agriculture, just as the, the chairman has just mentioned. It also looks at the risk sharing incentives to financial institutions as a means to encourage our culture finance. Now we'll start off, next slide please. I'll start off with uh, our, current, uh, our current status. I will here, I've used two examples of successful uh, risk, risk sharing arrangements currently that are in place which we are also compare to the one in Nigeria. Now we have two major risk 
sharing arrangements. We have the Alcacho Credit Finance and the Bank of Uganda. And then we also have the ABI Trust. Both of them do offer guarantees. The Bank of Uganda offers 50% cash cover with a fixed interest rate, which we have, which you, you and it's mainly focused at CAPEX, that is capital in financing. And of course, recently we also had, we have also the grain facility. While ABI focuses on 50% performance guarantees across the whole value chain. Now we'll notice that utilization has been more on the, the lower side of the value chain. There's always a bit of confusion which side of the value chain is lower. But when I refer to that, that means it more of them look from, from post-harvest trade and export. Very little goes to, to primary production. As regards taking into consistent, the, the ABI finance does not provide it. However, it has components that do provide that. But as mentioned today, as we should agree, that without entrepreneurial skills, a money is not a solution to, to, the, to the poverty gap. Uh, insurance, uh, the insurance product was recently launched. Uh, we, uh, it is also supported by ABI, and hopefully it should, should uh, support and reduce the risks in financing agriculture. And the other ones we have is the, are the interest drawback mechanisms, and uh, which is not yet in place here in Uganda. And of course, we also have lines of credit. Lines of credit. The ABI does provide uh, lines of credit, which are available uh, to qualifying financial institutions. Uh, the Bank of Uganda has no direct lines of credit. However, there is a 50% uh, cash cover, and therefore there is also a need to have a subsidized line of credit that is primarily aimed at uh, agriculture production. Next, please. So looking at that, so what are the key challenges that we will notice currently? One is lack of entrepreneurial skills in the farming community. Now we, we all do agree that without transforming their minds, without transforming the way we do farming and looking at it as a business, the, 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 the need for culture financing will not help much. And then the second is that the current credit risk schemes, schemes are more skewed towards the lower side of the value chain, just as I've, I've explained, the focus on trade and value addition. Now this is, has become, of recent it has become a challenge, because as, uh, as, as most of you know, uh, most of us in the, in, uh, in the financial sector, especially banks, we are financing more of the value addition, the processing and trade. And of recent, we've had, that we've had, and you also know, for example, the sugarcane industry, the sugarcane producers are now short of raw material, which is sugarcane. So that focus, the more focus we focus on the other side of the value chain, leaves the other value chain hanging. And the other thing is the low agriculture credit skills in, in uh, in, uh, the, in, the, in the financial institutions combined with the limited regulation. When I talk of limited regulation, it's most mainly focuses at microfinance because the banking sector in Uganda is well regulated. And then we also have complex credit assessment process, procedures and high transaction costs, which lead, of course, which lead to expensive credit availability to, to the end user. And then the last one, which is also very important, is the lack of coordination between the several stakeholders with each entity playing within its small domain. So we have several NGOs who are looking at different value chains at different villages. We have several microfinance institutions dotted everywhere looking at a different part of the value chain. Then we have us, the big financial institutions, in the big towns also looking at do something. So we kind of uncoordinated and yet we're aiming at the same thing. Next. So addressing these issues requires an innovative approach, hence establishing an incentive-based risk sharing facility in Uganda would be a welcome development supported by other interventions as mentioned in the recommendations from previous meetings. And what does this involve? Let's just go to the next one, please. Now, 
And this is what it involves. The concept has four things or, or rather four pillars which can become five pillars that we suggest we could look at. One is to fix the agricultural value chain so that banks can lend with confidence to the sector. Now, when I talk about a value chain, that means that for one to go into farming, he has to have the end picture where is what he's producing, where is it going. And that, of course, from the farm to the table, there are a number of players in between. And without approaching agriculture financing using that perspective, there's not much we can do. The second one looks into the possibility of provision of subsidized wholesale funding to microfinance sector, which will in turn cut the cost of borrowing aimed at the rural households. We will notice that, that whereas we want to lend to the farmers at the cheapest rate that one can have, and yet the microfinance institutions are so unfortunate that they are the ones who if they access funds, they access only very expensive funds. And the next one is to encourage banks to lend to their cultural value chain by offering them strong incentives and technical assistance. And finally, as a means to encourage farmers to pay back their loans by offering an interest drawback mechanism on repayment of their loans. So the cost of borrowing is reduced. I'll explain this in detail. So this scheme should, however, emphasize lending to the value chain to all sizes of producers. If you look at one, you pull out one, then the rest will not work. Next, please. So let's just look at what a value chain would be. We all know what it would be. But what I just wanted to, to mention here is that whereas we have an agricultural value chain, we also do have an agricultural financing value chain. If you look at the products that are offered right from input producers to trade and export, there are different financial institutions playing a different role. And as I mentioned earlier on, that most of us who are in the commercial banking sector are more on the other side, agro-dealers, agro-processors, industrial manufacturers, trade and export living uh, alone the farmers. But then the important thing is, is that we need each other. There are parts of the financial chain that cannot be financed by a big commercial bank seated in Kampala. And then there are also parts of the financial chain which involves those on the production side that can be ably done by, by a microfinance institution. And each of us rely on each other because what the microfinance institution finances is eventually taken up by either trader or processor who is financed by a commercial bank, which is eventually taken up for export, which is financed by big multinational banks and institutions. Next, please. So what is the risk, what's the risk sharing mechanism? This will, we were taken through it uh, during the last meeting, but just for purposes of today, I'll also go through it today. Now, my main focus here was going to look at the farmers, and the emphasis here is on two, is a two-pronged mechanism. One is that for most of this uh, uh, financing for farming, we have up to about 13% loss that they incur in their books, which explains the high cost of financing. And then secondly, we have to realize the fact that we cannot finance individual farmers who are scattered everywhere. So the portfolio approach and linking these small farmers who are either in groups or association to the end user or off taker. Now this can either be two, can be two prompt. One, one that is driven by demand in which the off-taker or the processor leads the farmers to produce for, for that particular entity or the farmers coming together to bulk and push forward to the market. Now, this, in this instance, we're suggesting that it's an up to 80% guarantee cover, put for first loss guarantee cover, so that the financial, the, the microfinance institutions
can now go in confidently knowing that 80 percent of their 12 percent or 13 percent loss is covered by a first uh, uh, by a first loss guarantee and for the rest of the other ones the larger ones the agribusinesses the 50 to 30 percent guarantee cover is sufficient next please now this is a key a key factor uh, this is a technical assistance a technical assistance will improve the functions of the culture financial value chain through building capacity for lending and borrowing and encouraging linkages along the value chain now you will notice i've put we've put there the banks the insurers the microfinance institutions and we're looking at the key gaps, the role of technical assistance, and the linkage opportunities. Now for financial institutions, as mentioned uh, by one of the speakers below, before me, there's limited capacity to assess our cultural risk. We always take it for granted, but there's limited capacity. And I always say this to ourselves, that as, as parents, we keep our children in town, they go to the best schools, they will do what? And these are tomorrow's bankers. But if you ask them what it takes for a bean to germinate, they will just give you the theory part of it, but they don't know what is going on. And those are today and tomorrow's bankers. And also, the fact that also banks do have a limited rural approach. But let's look at the microfinance institutions. Provide microfinance with access to small borrowers. Limited access to funds, that's the key gap, and limited capacity to assess agricultural risk. And this is key to the microfinance institutions. And when you look at farmer groups and non-banking MFIs, there's so many there, circles and SLAs, whatever they call them. These provide limited microfinance and access to small borrowers. They are poorly organized. They are unable to articulate business plans. They do not have collateral. They do not maintain history. And therefore, they also need capacity building. And of course, if we can go to farmers and SMEs to enable them to articulate business plans and also as a means to support the collateral, no collateral, no credit history. So building capacity across this chain will first of all for the financial institutions build capacity to assess our cultural risk and develop and distribute our culture friendly products while for the microfinance the farmer groups building capacity to access loans and i have to stress that from the beginning that the farmers or the farming entrepreneurs or the small farm for small traders need to be trained need to have entrepreneurial skills without entrepreneurial skills and without knowing what they want to do it is suicide to start with money and then second also to build capacity to improve productivity uh, this is key as we've just heard about it because the current productivity is so small we're talking about 20 percent of capacity and that 20 percent capacity is not commercially viable so this linkage opportunities will produce leverage uh, on the, the microfinance network because as I said before you cannot look at financing our culture as, as a separate institution entity we all need to work together as financial institutions the microfinance plays its role okay we start from lower end circles do their own MFIs do their own and then the banks also do their own and of course not forgetting insurance which is already in place but it needs to be utilized and the utilization of insurance is dependent on the demand for the financing so if there's no demand for financing it is very difficult to convince a small farmer who has his several small chicken goats and what to take on insurance so all this will leverage farmer groups to to be able to access loans next please Okay, so let me continue. So, so there are some slides that are missing. So then the other aspects that I looked at is financing. 
MFI funding and interest drawback mechanism. So there's a need to set up an additional fund for provision of subsidized wholesale funding to the microfinance sector, which will in turn cut the costs of borrowing aimed at the rural household. Or there are two sides of it. The other one is the interest drawback program, or IDP. This is an interest rate management framework to reduce effective borrowing rates without the complication of introducing dual interest regimes or contradicting the existing deregulation policy of government. In other words, if a farmer goes to a microfinance institution or a commercial bank to borrow and his loan performs according to the, co the agreement, the contract, or the, the, the terms and conditions, that interest for that period is refunded to the farmer. Now this not only will reduce on the cost of financing, but also encourage the farmer because not only will they, are they looking at earning from the crop, but when they repay their loans, a percentage of that financing will be refunded. And this will inevitably also reduce on the cost of financing, but with an incentive for them to repay and to work harder. Finally, the critical success factors. I have only mentioned here, I'll just mention two, but there are a number of them. We definitely need our stakeholder support. We, all of us in here, need to support uh, this, uh, this suggestion. This needs financing, financial support from government. Because for some of these items like uh, the subsidized lending to microfinance institutions, two, and then the interest drawback mechanism need support from government. Secondly, and, and the others, of course we have had the African Development Bank and AGRA also encourage us in the same scheme. And of course, not forgetting all of us who are in here, we have a number of donor communities and other stakeholders who, need to, who we need to work together closely to ensure success of this, of this program. And finally, as mentioned earlier on by the previous speaker, operationalization of the Uganda Microfinance Regulatory Authority to give credence to the MFIs and other institutional forms that will, regul that will be regulated to be able to develop products and deliver mechanisms that can support financing of agriculture. To be able to sustainably support the MFIs and also to support the agricultural finance, these financial institutions need to be regulated. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Mr. Wangwe, for that well-researched presentation. And uh, the little that I've picked out of what Mr. Wangwe has presented to us is uh, the 68% rural community that cannot that are not in money, the money economy and that is what we are striving to ensure that the get to the money economy come year 2020. But then the challenges ahead of us are so many. One of it is accessibility of the finances to the rural community and the building capacity is another issue that is of great concern. And then being business or being it with what the president has always called do it with each other. What do you want to do with a facility if at all it is available to you? What do you want to grow? Do you want to grow maize? Do you want to grow beans? Do you want to grow coffee? With a chivalo is what are you going to attain from what you are going to grow. If you grow maize, 
in, for example, two acres of land, and if you grow coffee in two acres of land, what are the output? What do you expect? Those people need to be sensitized. Fine, the financing would be available, but we may not be in position to effectively utilize the financing. So it is upon us to sensitize and really build capacity in this area. If we just give out loans, if we just give out finance to this sector, and we, <coughs> behind everything, we all know that agriculture is a backbone of the economy, it is economy. So if we don't handle it well, we are bound to result. And we may not attain what we want to attain come year 2020. So this meeting has been very, very timely. And uh, really, let us embrace and put into practice whatever presentation that has been made and it has been made here. In Uganda, in Uganda here, we are very good at research. We are very good at policy making, but we are poor at implementation. So, let us really address the issue of implementation if we only want to achieve. And if we want to benefit from the good research and from the good policies that we make. Um, hello, colleagues and uh, participants. We all know that uh, some of the, the participants here have another session to attend in Parliament. We shall try as much as possible to be brief. I thought maybe I present to you only those two, but uh, the organizers requested me to allow Ms. Dr. Fred Mwemusa to come and make his presentation um agriculture finance panel. Or oh, the topic is proposal. Proposals on our forward. That is the topic. Proposals on our forward by Dr. Mwamuza. And Mr. Mwamuza is in finance. Is a member on the agriculture finance panel. AFP. Please, Dr. Mumuza, just you make your summary, your presentation, and you summarize it in only five minutes because we want to open the discussion for the participants and uh, we end this meeting as quickly as possible. Dr. Mumuza, please. Some changes that uh, have been communicated to me, and that is what I want to pass over to you. Uh, Dr. Momoza will come in after the discussion. So now Dr. Momoza is limiting my being here. You know, uh, uh, sitting in a chair is very easy, but leaving it is very difficult. <laughs> So I don't want to leave this chair at this time, but Dr. Momoja, I think because of what arrangement, he felt it right that we open a discussion uh, before he comes in and uh, makes his remarks. 
So at this time, I just want to thank the organizers of this meeting for giving me this chance to share this session. And uh, I would at this moment want to take back the microphone to Dr. Atoj Kasirov. Dr. Atoj Kasirov is uh, in my docket. Minister for the Presidents, it has five dockets. So we do things together. Our offices are open. If there's any problem, if there's any way forward that you want Uganda to go, the offices are open, the ministers are open, everybody. So Dr. Kasirov, thank you for listening to me and thank you for coming. Thank you for being good participants and thank you for all the presentations that you've made. I'm sorry I have so many things that I'm coordinating and I will not be with you to the end of this meeting. I just request that you allow me live. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. And thank you for your gracious displays. And this conference I know shall be again to another time. We are going for discussion and uh, I'm calling to all the members who have issues to raise, to, to propose. The floor is open. Ambassador, you had started, but I don't know whether you want to continue. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Minister. I don't hope to chase away uh, the bankers like uh, I caused the problem with the uh, chairman of the national planning. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam, thank you very much. But uh, before you go, Madam, the issue of these conferences, sometimes I want you to know is that when we speak and attack people who are speaking, it is because we have come here to solve the bad problems. The good problems, we don't need to talk about them. And these bad ones, we need to discuss them so that we can understand, and then we find a solution. And find solution. And yeah. that's why we have come here, so that nobody runs away. I'm not saying you because you are going for another meeting. There was an earlier incident, <laughs> so that we can we can seriously discuss these issues and clear the air, because there is nobody but us to do this job. Yes, yeah, true. And so we have to, unfortunately. And as somebody wisely said, our grandfathers were not able to, then our fathers did a bit, now we have to do what they didn't do, what we have to do, otherwise we leave it to our children. So we have a very big job, and the point here to me is, why is it that most people in government become defensive? Think... When, actually, yeah, when actually even we go for elections so that we find out whether they were or they were not. I think that is a fact really that uh, we don't want to hear about more so with this Cassandra Kulamachezo. Yes, but now if we don't discuss it, how will you know the other side? Because if we don't know it between ourselves, you find people going to accuse you to the president. So it's better we all talk it here and we, we all agree and solve it. That is why we have opened the discussion to everybody. I think the discussion is open to everybody. And uh, by the way, if you don't really put the bad thing, the bad side of a problem, there is no way you can solve the problem. So the solution to achieving what you want is to look at the bad side and we we'll see how we can address it. Yes. Thank you so much. So on that note, I am saying from what we have heard here, we need to have more frequent meetings with our bankers outside the bank mm -hmm. so that we don't go in just to ask for loans and they say hakuna pesa what we want is also for them to come like for me i refuse to borrow any money from any bank until the bank knows my business and many times they don't know the business so there is a problem of lending you on other terms. Lending without a chivalo. No, without even them knowing that my conditions are different. Yes. Because I may have to pay two months later, three months later, then every month. But for them, they are used to a certain protocol. Even their computers are designed in a particular protocol. When the protocol of the God with the rain and God with the sun has not signed an agreement with the bank. And there are some clauses that are not made clear. Ah. 
to the client. Yes, so in this regard, therefore, it's important, out of knowing agriculture is important, that the banks open up and we start to drive in a dialogue so that they are, their fears are reduced. As I'm speaking now, the banks refused to give me money from the beginning, and I'm very happy that they did, because if they did, I would have been bankrupted. I said they would take you to another level. No. Uh, yes, below. <laughs> that level below, not up. I don't want to mention that. <laughs> no, they would have killed my business. What I'm trying to say is that it gave me alternative financing. This is what I'm trying to say. Because mm -hmm. I'm in rice. Rice is financed because the market is there, not because the banks are there. Mm -hmm. Now, because the market is there, actually the banks should have come. Yes. But they didn't come because they did not know rice. I think you are getting me. So we would like them to know these things. Earlier on, coffee was straightforward because it was one product, cotton was one product, everybody was there, research, government, cooperatives, and it was exported to Europe. So all energies was focused. But when they liberalized the economy, I think the banks became disabled. And, and also the, the government officials became confused because it was too broad and too many things. And, and this is why there is a problem. And if we don't discuss these issues, we get stuck. I think now that the discussion says it's open, yeah. uh, I request the bankers, please. Ha. The bankers to be patient, because out there, there are so many issues that need to be addressed that really concerns financial institutions. So if these issues are brought forward to you, then we will, you know, Come to a dialogue, and you come, uh, you'll be getting these meetings often, quite often. And the aim of these meetings is to solve the problems ahead of us. So very many people are aggrieved, very many people are bitter about the banks, financial institutions. So if a few of them come to mention of this, please don't, it is not bad. It is good to share experiences. It is good, even you, you have what to tell them. They may, they may not be knowing what exactly the bank does. So we need to get together, we need to get together and discuss our way forward. Pay the way forward. The, the, the aim of the meeting is uh, agricultural financing in Uganda. Agriculture cannot go uh, uh, alone. It cannot do um, activities alone. It needs financing. Neither does financing um, uh, be able to do. It can't do uh, anything alone except if it has clients to come and you know take up the loans and then build the institutions together. Let us be together and build the institutions, sectors, and then we are there because we are all striving to achieve one goal. Come year 2020, if there is anything that is stopping us from achieving it, please let us address it now. Okay. But so, let me conclude, madam, because the point here is, it is also true that the businesses need what they call business development services. Yes. Or even me, I have grown because I've acquired business development services. And so I have grown. Sometimes I discovered I did not need money, I need systems development. Sometimes I need human being development, capacity development. So all of us, the banks and us, we need to grow together. Because when you grow, then you are safer with the bank, and the bank is safer with you. So to me, I think this has been absent. What we need, therefore, is to accept where we in the business sectors are weak. The bank should also accept where it is weak. Like right now, I was telling my brother here that if banks are correct, how come Equity Bank, which was nothing, 10 years ago has become bigger than the biggest bank in Nairobi, uh, Barclays Bank. Because Barclays Bank was weak in certain things. So, it, uh, so the, even our banks have problems. So they did not take advantage of the weakness of them? No, there was no disadvantage. It was stunted. Mm. So the other one grew. That one, I'm not aware. He has to inform us. Uh, no, it is true. They know it between themselves. <laughs> so we need, we need to accept that there is a big need to work on their weaknesses in our context and our weaknesses as private sector in our context and our weaknesses of the I think the way forward here is if there is any weakness that you feel like uh, 
please bring them out and the bankers are here too. Yes. Yeah. To listen and then give their views. One of them is they should employ agriculturists who know the finance of agriculture. Most of the bank staff are bankers, they are accountants and economists who don't know agriculture. But that is just one. But the other people have got something to speak. Let them also speak. That's a recommendation. Okay. Let's see. Uh, next. Unfortunately, I didn't pick you. I didn't get your name, so I'm saying. Eh? Uh, just press and make sure. My name is John yeah, Peter Nebe. Uh, no, this is not on the front here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is David Cheyune. I'll switch off the mic. Just press once. Eh? Just press once and it will be on. Yeah. Uh, my name is David Cheyune from Veco East Africa. Uh, I, I just want to, uh, to take you back to the paper which was presented by Mr. Edward Katende. He outlined very good recommendations. And when I looked at he, most of those recommendations, it's just business as usual. You know, formulating policies, you know, developing uh, appropriate financial products. And some of these things have been in place. And uh, I just want to caution you that if we are not really very, very, very serious, we might end up doing uh, the same things and achieve nothing. I want you, I, I, if you can take an assumption that if, this, if we had the financial products at the disposal of farmers, would the farmers borrow the money? For example, if you take a bank in, in Nakaseki, would farmers come and borrow this money? You may find that, you know, uh, many times you, we say that these uh, products are available and they are appropriate, but uh, on, the, <coughs> you know, on the demand side, farmers are not prepared to borrow that money simply because they are not very sure of the market. Therefore, if we want to stimulate uh, farmers to borrow, we have to guarantee that the market is available. Therefore, we have to invest in serious agro-processing, not this, you know, small juice processing which I normally see around. Those, are just, those ones will not take us somewhere. What I'm talking about is the investors, for example, now which you are to, uh, we are talking about to come to Uganda, are they focusing on investing uh, in agricultural processing, big factories, such that they can create a massive market uh, for, for agriculture and the farmers will be motiva motivated to borrow and invest in agriculture and even the banks themselves will be motivated because they know that they are going to lend it to a farmer who will be able to grow and also sell to the market which is available. I've seen many times people are encouraging, you know, everybody has become an agro processor. But if that is putting a burden to a farmer. Because, you know, if you tell these small farmers in my village to process juice, tomato, you are complicating their life because they, they are going into what they cannot afford, things like marketing, advertising, you know, uh, uh, National Bureau of Standards will come in, you find that they will not go anywhere. There are, for me, my recommendation is to think about serious uh, investment in agro-processing. Uh, agro Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Madam Cassidy. Uh, switch off. Switch off. Uh, thank you, Chairman. For me, I would like to. Uh, I'm from. Uh, I'm a, a member of the board of UAA. Uh, I would like to to comment on the uh, presentation by uh, Mr. Richard Wanga. When I, I looked at it, for me, I'm not a banker, but I thought from the the, the point of uh, looking at the agricultural value chain, the gaps in financing were being closed or being called co co uh, connected. There is one thing which, uh, however, I, I, I believe I'm, I'm still missing. We have ignored the big farmers and what they can do to the whole value chain if they are also brought on board. When the bankers lend money, they lend these bad, big farmers just for themselves. I don't think there is an incentive for them to help these small farmers to come on board and they work together 
for mutual benefit. And yet these big farmers have the ability to provide services for extension, look for good inputs. This is a gap which is missing. It's not only missing here, but also when I looked at the plan from uh, the PMA, again, we looked at the poor farmers and we did not look at how we could link the people who have the knowledge and uh, they are in the sector and they can provide finance and the bankers can even give them finance but with an incentive to give to the, to the small farmers. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm Ivan Asimo from Uganda Cooperative Alliance, the Agri Business Manager. Uh, before I bring in my submissions, I would really want to ask my fellow colleagues here, we need to really, I want to ask, what is the problem? Because we are here talking about agricultural financing. Is the problem that there are no banks to give money? Is it that farmers are not there to borrow? It is food for thought. We need to understand and get to the core of this issue. I don't like blaming personally, I like giving solutions. Now, when you are talking about agricultural financing, here we have banks. Assuming these were all of us here, we are farmers. We went to these banks to borrow for agricultural financing. Do any, either the banks or the farmers have the information? Because there is information gap. A bank cannot give you money for agriculture unless they have information on what you are in. Information on weather, information on soils, information on insurance, information on market. So minus that information, the banks are reluctant to give the money. On the side of a farmer, it is the same story. There is that information gap. We know that these banks have money for agriculture. But are our farmers aware of this? Personally, I have been discussing with some people here. Some of us, the elites, are not aware that banks have money for agriculture. So who will tell my mother in the village that you go to a bank, there is money for agriculture? Now, to that context, like in Uganda, in Uganda Cooperative Alliance, we are implementing a project which is called, it is market-led, user-owned ICT for agriculture information services supported by the Netherlands government, where a farmer can access information using technology, information on weather, information on insurance, information on agronomic tips using a smartphone. You even now, a farmer will know that it will rain at 2 p.m. In, at this hill, and even the, 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 the whole information is there. So, if this information was available to both the farmers and the banks, I think agricultural financing would be, it wouldn't be a problem. So that is one recommendation. Let us look at information technology. How this information can be accessed by either the banks or the farmers and even the insurance companies. We had a discussion with them. They are reluctant to ensure agriculture because they lack information. They cannot quantify, they cannot know the risk the extent of the risk. Neither can they compensate the farmer because they don't have data. So we need to look at this heavily invest in ICT. The other issue is about involving the farmer organizations. I'm from Uganda Cooperative Alliance. I don't know how many of the farm organizations are here. Maybe if they are here, do we have any here? So you can see. These people are supposed to be at the forefront because we are the people dealing with the farmers. We know them. We know what is happening with them. Then the other one is about support. Like my father here, ambassador. He has heavily invested in agriculture. But what support is he getting from government? We need to understand that. The other time, I, I am also coordinating a project in northern Uganda, Nukasava. We went to northern Uganda. There is a lot of cassava. But the farmers were not aware that there is a market for cassava. Until we made a research and found out that cassava is being imported from other countries by Uganda breweries, by Kamutek Technologies. 
Now, yes, Uganda breweries buys 400 metric tons of cassava per month to make beer. This is Senator. Senator Stout. Come take technologies in Lira, which processes ethanol, buys 15 metric tons of cassava per day. But do we have the farmers who can satisfy the market? Are they organized? The other month in December, I happened to be in Netherlands. I went to The Hague. I entered the supermarket. I found our coffee from, it is written CP coffee, from CP Forums in Kapturwa. A kilo of coffee in Netherlands is 24 euros, which is 90,000. How much is paid to our farmers here? Now, if you are a bank and you are to give out loans, and you can't have that information, then there is a problem. I even went further to ask the person in the supermarket, do you really support our farmers in Uganda? You know what he told me? We cannot support your farmers because the coffee that comes from there, 60% of it is contaminated with foreign material. So and that, that is another recommendation. Let us have a policy on post-harvest handling so that we can get the market. And the moment there is a market, as my colleague was saying, banks will be willing to lend because they are sure that the money will be recovered. Then another recommendation, the warehouse receipt system. Can we have it work? If I'm, let's say in a cooperative, I have barked my maze, I have a receipt, can I take the receipt to a bank and I access money? That should be supported. The other support is on consolidating the services from within. When you go to agriculture, you find the NADs, you find the Wales Creation, you find the Minister of Agriculture, you find whichever. Kaip is there, the Minister of Local Government is giving agro-processing machinery. But when you go down on the ground, the farmers are confused because the information is a bit contradictory. We don't have a consistent approach in terms of developing agriculture. Then, creating awareness, as I started with, we need to create awareness. Our farmers need to know that services are there. If it is about financing, the money is there, it is the DFCU, the interest rate is this, the conditions are A, B, C, D, and you are very clear with that. Then, lastly, is about creating subsidies for agricultural investments. Uganda Cooperative Alliance got some complaints around 2008. We wrote to the Commissioner General, you are A, on the issue of taxation of circles. And then, what happened? We found out that already the government had created a subsidy on all incomes by banks generated from agricultural loans. And it was effective 1st of July 2005. Government which created that subsidy did not even go ahead to follow to know whether actually the banks were giving money to farmers, but these banks were using that avenue to generate more revenue because the subsidy was there. So the farmers did not benefit from this subsidy. Until 2014, the national budget, when this subsidy was removed, now all incomes are tax, they, they are taxable. There is no exemption, it was removed. Now, surely you tell me, if you cannot create a subsidy for, to allow financing of these investments, how do you expect the investors in agriculture to move forward? Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Now, Uganda Corporate Valley is one of its uh, objectives is to organize the farmers in two cooperatives which are functional, and that's why we should be moving in that direction. Make sure the farmers are organizing the cooperatives and they are able to get this information. So we need also to move, and one of the recommendations is to strengthen farmers, groups, and cooperatives also. Yeah. So you next time you need to, to tell us how far you have moved in making sure these organizations yeah. Because if farmers are organized and they get information, they also demand for certain things. But Ambassador Edro raised a very important issue which needs to be answered. Are people in the banks 
for those who are working in the banks, do they appreciate financing agriculture? Or they, they, are, they are being trained in the bookkeeping and balancing books and, and when it comes to issue of culture, I, I would have wanted one day somebody to, to give us information. One time UCB, UCB had this rural farmer scheme. It, 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 it was there. They had employed agriculturists and vets, and those ones were in charge of. And there was, we have to accept, there was a boost in production. The problem was marketing. Maybe somebody can analyze and say we could have done ABC. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I'm uh, from Standard Chartered Bank. And I'd like to say the following. I think banks are fully aware of the requirements of the agricultural sector. And I think Dr. Kasekende explained very clearly that when cooperative bank and Uganda Commercial Bank engaged in some agricultural lending, they ended up being bankrupt because they couldn't handle some of the risk, risk issues. So it's very important if you are a banker, you have to be very careful. If you're going to be, to prevent your bank from going under, you have to make sure you are able to handle the risk. Now, Dr. Wangwe and uh, Dr. Kasekendi have explained it very, very clearly that commercial banks may not be the best direct contact to uh, farmers who are in subsistence, okay? These farmers are very small. Many of them don't have uh, financial literacy. They don't keep books. They are not even aware but they don't have a plan of what they intend to do, which they can bring to a bank and sell it to the bank. So what is happening is the best interface to these type of farmers who are in subsistence has tended to be the microfinance institutions. And I think that's where we should put some emphasis. And I think as Dr. Wang was saying, those microfinance institutions can then work with banks to create a chain of financing for agriculture. In other words, the microfinance could interact directly with the farmers, provide the loans, maybe they could package them and sell them to commercial banks. So that's one aspect of it. The other thing which is very important, which we haven't touched on, is the other side of the financing uh, sector. That is, commercial banks tend to focus on short-term financing. <coughs> But they need to work with the, for example, National Social Security Fund or other pension funds, and also the capital markets, the stock exchange, and so on and so forth, to be able to develop or to access long-term financing, which they can access and then on loan to the private sector. So it's going to be very, very important in Uganda, and this was a major topic by uh, Dr. James, um, what's his name, and the CEO of uh, Equity Bank, Mwangi. He was here last week to talk to us at the CEO Forum. He's, by the way, also the chairman of Kenya Vision 30. So he had a lot of insights in what can be done on a national strategy. The point he emphasized was that insurance companies, no, no, sorry, okay, insurance companies actually, the stock market, and the pension sector have to be reformed. We have to have regulations and frameworks which can help the, uh, the long-term capital to be accessible to commercial banks, which they can then on loan perhaps to either commercial farmers or to work with uh, microfinance institutions to try to provide additional financing to the uh, farmers. Historically, as you know, banks used to play a very, very important role in uh, financing agriculture, particularly coffee, uh, cotton, and uh, tea, for example. That's when we had the Coffee Marketing Board, Lint Marketing Board, and the Produce Marketing Board. 
because those organizations put the farmers together and they were able to access finance directly from the banks for own lending to these farmers. So what has happened over the years is that the structure for, to organize farmers have actually collapsed. Cooperatives have collapsed. The marketing boards have been abolished. So the farmers are left in the dark. They are not able to be organized to be able to access directly from the commercial banks. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, thank you. But were these commercial banks financing produce marketing boards, marketing boards, were they financing the marketing aspect or the production? They were financing everything. When Coffee Marketing Board was existing, it used to buy crops from all over the country. They will bring it to Kampala for processing. You know, there is that plant at Bugorobi mm. where they used to do weight processing. They would then transfer it to Nairobi. They had warehouses there. They could engage in foreign sales of coffee. They could engage the largest coffee operators all over the world. And they could go all over the world to find markets for, 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 for coffee. So, yes, they would financing, marketing, production, processing, the whole value chain. Thank you very much. Uh, I have doubts. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to agree with my brother here on a few things, and I would like him to allow me to disagree with him on one or two. The truth of the matter is that there is no coffee which is never bought in Uganda. But now, the commercial banks have been locked out. Because the Volcafe, EDF Man, all these have a lot of money from Europe. So they buy them coffee. Is, is there any coffee left here in Uganda which is not bought? So is there any? No. They are all bought. So the fact is the coffee is bought. But these days they don't use our commercial banks. We who have been edged out because they didn't perform. But that doesn't matter. This is now foreign money coming direct. So that's not a problem. Even all our coffee has been bought. In fact, the truth of the matter, Mr. Chairman, is when I was the ambassador to China, you will remember, I used to ask, can I get a commodity in Uganda? After two containers, there is no commodity. So the truth of the matter is there is very little production. So it means not that there is, it just means there is a discoordination. The truth is, of course, since these are now commercial banks, you cannot do much. And we don't want to harass them. We want them to be healthy. All we are asking is for them to be a little bit more attentive to these issues. And then we are also asking, as Wangwe put and uh, Kasekan put very well, the other departments should come. Because increasing production may require just agricultural technology. It could require better seeds. It would require irrigation, which requires money. But it also requires knowledge of farmers or proper bucketing. All these are there. The issue now is what combination is best. What I know today is uh, Standard Chartered is big, so they deal with brewers and big banks. Centenary is small, so they no, no, deal with smaller banks. They have this kind of arrangement, but, uh, so, but it is not well developed. My, my, my thinking is uh, the, the, the banks are comfortable. The banks have been comfortable and they have been using the money to buy treasury bills, which has made them comfortable. In India, 4% by order of all banks must go to agricultural finance. 16. 16 now. And it is working. Now in Uganda, this hasn't been done. So there is a laxity. At the same time, I also know for a fact that most of these banks, when they lent money, even this money from the Bank of Uganda, there was a rush by all the banks to lend it, and they lent it badly, and the money became sour. That is the real truth of the matter. It is not that <laughs> they lent it badly. You know, when a bank lends you money, they appraise you badly, then they blame you for it. When somebody wants to borrow, whether it's a good one, they don't appraise, then the, so there is also a problem in the bank in appraising these monies. Although in the end, of course, you who has borrowed, you suffer for it. But my, ask, my issue is not blame game. My issue is how can we solve this problem of anxiety of the banks? I would rather they come out and we discuss more openly their fears 
and work with them so that this money which they lend does not fail. Nobody wants banks to fail. And none of these traders who, or farmers who borrow actually want this money to fail. African Ugandan farmers are very hard working, except the seeds are bad, the weather is confused, and all this. So I think we need, we need a greater dialogue. My view is a greater dialogue with these banks, because they are the nearest tools we have. If they can't, then we look at other alternatives. Thank okay. you. The other lady. Yes, uh, Honorable Minister, I'm Veronica. I'm the Managing Director of Pride Microfinance. I wanted to share with you, uh, for us at Pride actually, we mainly lend to the people at the base of the pyramid. Our average loan in agriculture is 1.8 million. So as you heard from the Deputy Governor, those subsistence small farmers are actually our niche. <laughs> How have, we been, interest? how have we sir about the interest mm. we have to know the drivers of interest government borrowing the risk free rates so there are number but I, I don't want to go there to the success our success actually has been that we've focused more on the farmer groups we have been able to work with the cooperatives, dairy cooperatives in Western Uganda. 93 of these cooperatives have been able to buy their own milk coolers. So when we are talking about the middle income status, our friends there are already there. We are also working with the Yugakov, with GIZ, to provide small loans. Actually, the average there is just 700,000 for the coffee farmers. And because these guys are so so organized, even the ability to market and sell all their coffee is very fast. Now the issue of the agriculture insurance scheme, we need to look at that further, because when you look at the strutters that we are given, the small scale starts from 20 million. Can we come up with a lower strata of micro agriculture farmers such that also those are covered just like uh, our colleague from Stanbic shared with us at a rate of 80% coverage it, it will make more sense then also we love the aspect of government coming in and giving funds and so on but there is this culture that Ugandans are so obsessed about of free things so the communication strategy is very important for government when they give in these funds. Because as soon as a, a rational Ugandan knows that this money is coming from government, they will not pay a single coin. So those are my contributions. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> money from commercial banks to microfinance institutions. Money coming from Standard Bank at 22% to a microfinance institution on loan farmers at what percent? Because what, that's what should come out. With the farmers, if a farmer, a small farmer, getting money at 36%, assuming it's 2% per month, is this farmer going to, to make it? This is what has not come out, out of this meeting. How do we make sure that we make money, relatively cheap money, available to farmers. Because one of the problems that could be among the farmers is they cannot afford the money. Even if it is there, they cannot afford it. It is very expensive. Also, so how do we make sure, how do we make sure that we have relatively cheaper money, which is easily accessible, and then uh, is it not possible these uh, non-performing assets, one of the reasons is uh, because the, the money is expensive. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, the most expensive money to a smallholder farmer is not having it. That is the most expensive money. The opportunity cost of 
of, uh, of not getting finance for their uh, enterprise and not being able to use their enterprise is you end up with a scenario where let's say they're growing a, a crop of maize the same effort in terms of digging in terms of planting in terms of weeding without improved seed and fertilizer means that they're getting a third of the yield that they would get if they got a little bit of money for the uh, for the uh, for the maize and the fertilizer um, in many of the models that we see it is actually not the cost of finance which is the issue for smallholder farmers it's the lack of finance uh, for smallholder farmers and the lack of cash flow finance to be able to to get them from one season to to to, to another so um, um, subsidizing finance into agriculture may not be the answer and in any schemes which I've seen in other countries where finance has been uh, subsidized into agriculture there hasn't been that much of a positive outcome and you cannot continue and in the countries where subsidies have been uh, put in at very high levels they have been completely unsustainable I've seen I've seen governments bankrupt because of the subsidies that they put into agriculture that in subsequent seasons the farmers cannot adopt good agricultural practices and get access to seed and fertilizer because the government can't pay the subsidies anymore and therefore they don't get the finance they don't get the seed they don't get the fertilizer and their yields go back to the to the to the low levels it is the consistency and the continuity of the correct amount of finance into into smallholders that can actually make a big difference and there aren't there aren't many um, uh, value chains where uh, microfinance cannot have a positive impact because I think the other thing that we should remember is there are many financing mechanisms in rural areas based upon informal lending where the interest rates if you calculate them on an annual basis uh, are 100 150 percent per annum uh, for, for the informal sources of finance so what we need to do is we need to get consistency of, of microfinance into into uh, smallholder farmers and to get these productivity levels up from the 20 30 percent to the 50 60 70 80 percent and then you can genuinely see a shift in uh, net household incomes in rural areas I had picked you then, uh, the old gentleman. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, I was, uh, like Dr. Kasamba, avoiding this topic, but I'm going to make a small comment. Um, one on um, microfinance. In reality, just to amplify what he has said, and I'll use a very simple example, a smallholder farmer who has invested his labor, and as Mr. Wangwe put it, may require just 200,000 shillings as a loan to complete his production process. If he gets interest at uh, where he's going to be charged 60,000 shillings on top of that 200,000, the net total refund he's going to give to the financial services provider is 260,000, and thereafter he'll harvest 600,000 of sales not giving him that loan may stop him from completing his simple production process. Now, in reality, 60,000 shillings interest on 200,000 may be a small percentage of, may look like 30%, uh, depending upon how many months. It could be even as much as 50% for that six-month period. But the issue is the importance and the value of that small agriculture finance so I think the academicians have researched and do documented that we actually have a need for agriculture finance at a smallholder level and it is viable pride microfinance was being shy about it but the truth of the matter is pride microfinance is very cheap the majority of the financial services which are being accessed by smallholder farmers are significantly more expensive currently as we speak. It is something which we need to pull the blanket off. So opportunity, pride, and all of these are the cheapest microfinancial services providers where they are doing 3% per month. That is marvelous. The majority of our farmers are borrowing much more expensively. 
My issue is uh, slightly different is Dr. Kasekende, Dr. Kasamba, Wangwe, and they all together came together with a few simple, similar conclusions, all revolving around the fact that we have very good policies. And in the side of agriculture, finance, and financial services, Mr. Wangwe has articulated quite effectively that we need capacity building in financial services providers, especially those venturing into agriculture finance, to understand the cash flow and how to lend effectively in that area. I think Standard Chartered Bank pioneered training in uh, credit skills uh, management in Uganda, and it has trained so many people in the country. So people are aware that the way in which agriculture finance has been done has been bad. We've been throwing money at people, not financing value chains. And then secondly, and concluding that, Ministry of Agriculture has, over the last two years, done a lot of soul searching, and they have identified that um, the provision of extension services to improve productivity is very critical. And that is the thing, Mr. Wangwe, and which Mr. Katende pointed out. And indirectly, that's what Dr. Kasekende was pointing out, that we actually have a problem which needs to be resolved, which is supporting the, the farmers to be more productive and more viable. Some of them, it is in entrepreneurship management, so that they can convert their mindsets from working at a subsistence approach to thinking commercially. I think the minister said, take a chivalo. And in the academics, they will say, being entrepreneurship oriented. So Minister of Agriculture has recognized that, and I think they have just in the process of uh, launching the new agricultural extension strategy in which they envisage working with the private sector, civil society, and many institutions from cooperatives and also, so that they can provide technical extension services to farmers so that they are more viable. It's something which they're beginning, and I think what is missing is getting the bankers to participate so that together they can be able to have better agriculture finance. Essentially, I think there are a few steps in the right direction. We actually need to harmonize that work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, you will be the last. I needed about two, three, because we are getting to lunch time, and the sugar levels like could be getting the, low. I would like to support farmers by getting a crop that they can quickly put in the garden one acre, they get the money, and that money will support them for three months. There is a crop that has come here called chai. You put in an acre, you get 450 kilos. Each kilo, each kilo they buy 3,000 shillings. A farmer will have some money. So if he goes for another loan, he has some money that supports him when he's doing some farming. And then the other one, what we have done with my friends, we talked to Tesco in London. Tesco wants to buy African produce here, which is organic. But our problem is processing it very well. So what we have done, we have tried uh, contract farming with some farmers. In northern Uganda, we have done that, and in Kenya. But because we don't have enough, we are already organized with the Kenyans to buy some of their produce, take to London to get that contract of Tesco, as we develop Ugandan farmers. And at the same time, my background is air freight before I came to Red Uganda. We have talked to the airlines. Some of my friends who work with East African Airways, Uganda uh, Airline, we have put our minds together with the British Airways to work a way in which we can get aircrafts to come down here, take the small farmers' produce, hit the market in Europe 4 o'clock in the morning there before the supermarkets open and our produce is there well prepared. Kenyans are doing it. Why Kenya developed Eldoret is because they wanted to take the market right to Europe. Ugandan farmers and those who do fishing, they freight it from Malaba to Eldoret. It's two hours. And the across take their produce early in the morning or at night. By the markets open, by the time the markets open in Europe, they have taken. So some of you have traveled, you have seen freighters, you have given trucks which you freight things. 
if the market reaches their le if the produce reaches their lead of, of flowers, you lose. So that okay, is what I'm you, doing. Uh, Uh, thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. I'm Justin. I work with UAP Insurance. Um, people have talked about financing the smallholder farmer. We need to use what we have. What do we have on the ground that we can use? Uh, Richard talked about the fact that banks can lend to the circles. That is key. We've worked with circles, and as we've done the insurance for farmers, it has been a very smooth relationship and very effective. The challenges circles have is availability of finance. They reach the farmers, they have the farmers, they have the farmers wanting the loans. The issue is the money. Because for them they usually just collect savings from their members. How do we finance circles? There are numbers, so many circles in Uganda which are doing financing to just not the smallholder farmers but even to other small businesses. We work with Pride as well, that has also been a good relationship. So for me, my issue would be what structures do we have and how can we leverage on the structures in place to move? We shouldn't really think about we're going to create this, create this, but what do you have that you can actually build on? Thank you. Thank okay. you. Dr. Mumza, can you take us through? Thank you, Honourable Minister, colleagues, good afternoon, everybody. I do not intend to stand in between yourselves and lunch, and that's why I preferred you speak before I come to make a way forward, because I think the way forward can only be out of your discussions. Just proceed. Uh, largely, as the system comes on board, I always have a fallback position is to say that uh, we've listened to quite a number of uh, provisions and discussions, and I think some of the key highlights that I can begin with uh, is the emphasis on coordination of the various uh, initiatives that are within government and out there in the private sector. People do not know what uh, finances are available in the banks for the farmers, the farmers possibly also do not know. And I think as reading from the presentation by Dr. Kasekende, there have been a lot of multiple initiatives involving government, and some of these I think listening in from Pride, uh, give different signals to the farmers. So the farmers are left at a loss, so we need to have some uh, coordination uh, mechanisms to bring together uh, the different initiatives. There is some financing out there, but it's not uh, in a coordinated way. There is also the strengthening of the financial and agricultural value chains. So the conclusions here that the current agricultural finance does not unlock uh, agriculture's potential, uh, partly because of the lack of coordination, as we've mentioned, disjointed things, the information, the message that came through on information. So we need to have catalytic financing that the public sector to stimulate private sector investment, but also financial institutions to unlock the longer term a patient investment finance specifically for uh, different components of uh, agriculture. So that should come up as a coordination. I think people are mentioning of uh, linking uh, the pension funds with uh, the commercial banks and trying to bring together so that the public finance, the private finance, and all the other different financing mechanisms and insurance can actually speak to, to each other. Stronger financial markets, uh, the, the governor said we, even if we do anything that we do, it has got to work within the market uh, principles, but we know markets sometimes are imperfect, sometimes they are incomplete, so the intervention should be trying to bridge and make sure those markets do meet the specific concerns uh, of agriculture, and I think one of the messages that has come through is the banks need to acquaint themselves with the knowledge of the agricultural sector, because the flows may not be monthly, 
Uh, so you may want to structure some loans that are paid every three months and the farmer can pay in two installments and finish off once they have harvested rather than demanding from them to pay maybe weekly or monthly when actually they are not able to do so. Next. As with the guiding principles, coordination of agricultural finance, both at policy and the practice level, I think that has been a key message and then more stakeholder approach is needed. Uh, consider both the financial and agricultural value chains. We've already mentioned that. Next, please. Uh, we need to implement the recommendations agreed in this meeting. Quite a number of recommendations. Many things have not been new. And I was listening in and I, I, I listened to things we have heard. And I think the president was right in his speech in Nairobi where he said the same thing that were mentioned were mentioned 50 years ago. So how do we take forward some of these things that we have been saying, even at least the basic a few things. A more stakeholder, more sectoral platform is needed uh, to coordinate uh, these kinds of interventions that are right now scattered in a number of, of areas. Next, please. This is kind of, uh, I think this is the major thing to dwell on, because it brings together the whole, at least an effort, to bring together most of the key pieces that need to be brought on the table in a multi-stakeholder coordination mechanism. What do we need to do with institutions? Institutions like cooperatives that group the farmers together, that provide inputs to them. Institutions like the funding, the, 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 the funding institutions or financial institutions, both the long term, the short term. The ones at the high end, the commercial banks, which deal with agro-processors and traders, but also the ones that are dealing at the bottom end to really advance small loans to the small uh, borrowers. I think it has been mentioned, some people just need 200,000. Others, the average loan as pride has told us 1.8 million. That means there are those who are smaller, there are those who are bigger. So how do we bring all these institutions together so that the whole entire value chain is covered? Uh, farmer profiling and identification. This is also to do with understanding the different enterprises and their characteristics. We need to bring agronomists on board, quite a number of other people that really understand the agricultural industry, generate that information, share that information. Cooperative Alliance was very emphatic on that. So that everybody knows uh, that the, the loan that I structure, the product I structure for a rice farmer should not be the same product as we structure for a, a coffee farmer or a fruit farmer in, in other areas or a dairy farmer. Each one of them have got different needs and concerns, but that information is needed. Insurance, definitely we have talked about the Nigerian experience, which can leverage a lot more money, 10 times as per uh, the, the experiment. Uh, the, that worked well in Nigeria that was shared uh, in this meeting. But also I've talked about other things, the infrastructure, both physical and how do we deliver extension services, the regulations so that you can remove things like counterfeit, because if a farmer borrows and then eventually buys counterfeit products, you don't know where to put the burden. Because the farmer will genuinely come back and say, I did all I could, but what I planted is never germinated. So there are quite a number of things that need to be brought on the same table in order to be able to fix uh, the agricultural financing, both from the financing value chain, but also from the agricultural uh, value chain. Next, please. We are looking at getting this to be implemented. As I've said, we don't want to come back 50 years later, those of you who will be around, to do another lamentation on what was discussed 50 years ago. The Asians did this, they designed an agricultural revolution, they have fed billions of people, the bulk of the population lives in Asia, and they have not had these disasters of food shortages in Asia. What is wrong with Africa, what is wrong with East Africa, what is wrong with Uganda? Why can't we make things moving? So we are thinking of at least putting in place some committees, one to look at the financial sector development uh, using existing uh, systems, but also to look at the value chain development committee. Each value chain has got its own unique uh, kind of characteristics and possibly needs a specific product to be designed for it. We cannot just talk about agricultural financing as if it is homogeneous. For traders, for car dealers, for construction companies, maybe there we can talk of homogeneity in terms of different products. But agriculture is different, so we need to be looking into those unique peculiarities of agriculture. And then also the Market Development Committee. I think the Minister was important to remind us about the problem that faced the rural farmer scheme, 
production actually came through, the marketing failed, and at the end of the day, the blame was put on the farmers, the blame was put on agriculture, and the programs were disbanded. So yet we did not complete the entire chain. So we're looking at those three specific committees, I think that should be put in place to see how we make our progress. And each committee should be able to develop a roadmap, um, focus the development area, and then be able to report back. And we're giving ourselves about four months. We don't want to take too much time because uh, the farmers are waiting. We are also waiting and we need to take this to the next level. Agriculture finance needs to be, uh, issues need to be a kind of uh, resolved. And I think the marketing point was emphasized there when somebody said financing is done uh, because the market is there, not because financial institutions are there. Even financial institutions want to know where is the market, but some of this information is kind of missing. And I think uh, the, the Agricultural Alliance is ready to do the coordination of this. So we'll be looking forward and approaching a number of you in different areas to come back to you and see which one of these committees uh, you'll be able to serve on and how to take it forward so that within another four months we're able to convene again and report on the feedback. Uh, let's check and see if there is any other slide uh, that was put on while I was asleep. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, any comment? No comment. That was very good. If you have a comment and a short one, then we can go for lunch. Very short. Uh, I'm Steve Hodges with Uganda Agribusiness Alliance. We've heard today um, about several of the uh, <clears throat> issues related to risk reduction, I would call it, uh, insurance, uh, land tenure issues, uh, the need for stronger extension that builds capacity of the farmers as business people. Um, I'm just wondering where that fits into this way forward. They're all risk reduction uh, issues, and it seems to me they need to be addressed some way. I will take a note. We're on your front. No discussion. Mm -hmm. Now you are the last one. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back on the issue of uh, subsidies in agriculture, and uh, because I I don't I I don't understand that. Um, uh, we, we need to, to provide technical assistance and uh, some, some sort of training to the, to the farmers. I mean, capacity building is very important. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that there is really no sustainable agricultural sector nowhere in the world without subsidies. So I, don't, I, I think that they, there should be a balance between what is provided as subsidy and uh, what is provided also as, as technical assistance. Uh, because uh, we need, uh, we can't also dismiss the, the whole issue of interest rate. Because uh, if, if, uh, if we are really serious about uh, transforming uh, small scale farming into a, a business, then we are also looking at issues of return on investment. So if the interest rates are very high, uh, then there is no no business really. So I think they, there should be a balance somewhere of subsidies and uh, uh, technical assistance. The, the reason why uh, subsidies didn't work in the past is because of, of the way it, is, uh, it was handled, not because the issue of subsidy is completely 